people out here are, are lost, man. People, people out here are hurting, man. Like people out here come from broken, broken homes. Um, people out here really don't have a reason to live anymore. Like they're here to die. All right, all right, everybody, come in, sit down, take a seat. All right, who's AA? Anything anonymous? No. Talk about, uh, your, you know, where you're from and uh, a little bit about yourself. And, uh... Welcome, everyone, to Dissolving the Divide. We're real happy to be here. We've been uh, waiting for this interview for a few months now, waiting for John and Well Chidester to get um, ready. And here he is today. So, um, hey, Derek, how are you? It's good to see you. Yeah, I'm doing great, Leslie, and uh, yeah, great to have a familiar friend uh, in the place. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm broadcasting from France. I got to introduce your name with a French accent. I just feel inclined, you know. Saint-Jean Pinel, she d'Estaire, le troisième, my friend. The domestic terrorist, keeping those principles first, you know, the revelator, if you will. <laughs> A uh, proud member of the One Great Work Network. He, you know, deep into Project Athena right now, Arc Gardens, you know, helping out Corey Angelid, you know, Jim Gale, familiar friends and folks we've had on our show as well. And Jesus Christ, how many things you got to get your hands involved in that are just, you know, full of divine care and all that great shit. Adopting a shelter pet, you know, dogs and turtles, tortoises, if you will. That's, yeah, and helping people recover from addiction. And this is, you know, I'm not going to rhyme with affliction, but yeah, this is kind of what we're, you know, coming together to talk about. And yeah, John, you have some really profound life experiences directly helping yourself and others in this. So uh, yeah, just thank you so much for coming on to chat about this really touchy subject, if you will. So yeah, man, how you doing? Wow, what an introduction. I, I Thank you so much, Derek. I, I haven't had anybody that really knew everything that I've got my hands involved with. So, I'm sure you there's know, more like, of it. <laughs> and to have the French introduction, you know, I used to sleep through French class in high school. But, you know, I do know a little bit. Uh, je suis Jean, uh, je suis American, uh, je ne parle la France, uh, la petite, <laughs> uh, C cafe <laughs> you know i know there you I go know a little bit. <laughs> you're getting a refresher refresher course <laughs> so you guys and you mentioned you know some of the you mentioned principles first and that's one of my uh, many facebook accounts and uh, the funny thing is is that used to be the actual home account for dynasty recovery lifestyle and housing uh when i was running nonprofit recovery housing in the city of philadelphia both in north and south philadelphia it's how i got my nickname saint john i was running around that city in a limousine named angel and we were helping people go from one point in their life to another point and they got to choose that destination but we treated them like rock stars so they gave me that nickname of saint john i've always tried to like you you and i and uh leslie we come together on that same common thread of care you know, like natural law, like applying the trivium, uh, trying to use holistic practices and using technology to our best ability to do deliver this message to people. And you guys are warriors in this fight. And I really appreciate uh, your, <laughs> see the logo. I really appreciate your support in this particular topic because it does touch home for me. And uh, I know we, we got a lot to discuss, man. But, you know, like I, I'm a victim of the system when it comes to uh, treatment. I'm also uh, a perpetrator in uh, being on the other side of the fence from someone that was in and out of drug and alcohol rehabs and institutions and, and jail systems, pr probations and paroles and all these different things that exist and going through different programs and asking for help. And then finally being on the other side of that coin, getting ready to celebrate 10 years without putting a needle in my arm or a crack pipe in my mouth, you know, and working in the field and running, you know, those nonprofit housings running, you know, running around with some of the most well-known and popular system choices for drug and alcohol rehabilitation and psychiatric hospital treatments uh, in the city of Philadelphia. So I'm grateful to be here and I'm really looking forward to these topics and uh, 
Thanks for having me on, guys. I'm, I'm glad we're bridging this gap, man, because I feel like I've been a little disconnected from some of the people in the network, man. And, and that's the One Great Work Network for anyone that doesn't know. Uh, and I'm really grateful to be here with you guys. Thanks for having me. So, so glad to have you. And this is a very important topic because so many people struggle with addiction and um, substance abuse and the uh, pathways to healing within the system are are not the best uh, at all times, right? The access is limited and uh, the process is cumbersome. And there's a lot of disconnects even within the system, a disconnect between substance abuse or addiction and mental health, you know, and just health in general, you know, and we're, we're living in a country where all sorts of um, concoctions, all of that, you know, um, are being, you know, brought into the country. We're hearing about the fentanyl, you know, being mixed with all sorts of other substances, a lot of deaths. Um, just would really, I'm really excited to hear your insights into what your experience was, um, and the path, the path. What do you, have you learned about, um, you know, the challenges to people healing? You know. Sure, and and well, you know, there's different angles to actually getting involved with the recovery process and being uh, supportive to people that are in that process. Uh, like I said, you know, I worked inside facilities. I've also volunteered for a lot of great organizations that are grassroots you know, boots on the ground, street level, like out there handing out bottles of water and, uh, you know, even fresh syringes, you know, which seems to be a big topic where like, you know, they don't want to enable people, you know, like this, uh, this safe, they have this safe zone that they can do things in. And, you know, like it really comes down to a lot of uh, uh, natural law principles, you know, like as long as someone's not harming another person, uh, they should have the right to do what they want to themselves, uh, you know, and in life in general. So it's like, how do we define a, addiction? How do we define recovery? You know, like these are topics that like if you're not actually in in the throes of these things, you might not have any uh, conception of what this is. You know, so like when we talk about addiction, we're talking about, you know, a behavior, a routine or a behavior, uh, life coping life skills, coping skills, reward systems, right? But, you know, like we should have those kind of things in place. So what defines it as something that's, you know, uh, something that you might want to get away from, like something that would be repetitive, but addictive. And, you know, it would be the negative consequences involved. You know, like for me personally, I, you know, dying, going to prison, losing family, separation from my daughter, all these kinds of things uh, weren't trigger points for me. But there was a point where I, I had had enough. I had, I had had enough and I did not want to suffer the negative consequences of utilizing uh, substances in my life. So I had to do something. And what I, what, what I had done is I went back in my history of putting periods of uh, clean time together. That's what they call it. They call it clean time when you're in the beginning of a recovery process. You start putting together a few days without using the substance of choice, right? So you define what those things are and you work to eliminate them from your life. And then you have to restructure things. You have to create positive reward systems. You have to create uh, uh, beneficial life skills. You know, you have to create uh, coping, uh, coping mechanisms that are going to work for you. You know, and how do you do that? Well, you, you, you reach out and you ask for help. I mean, one of the hardest things that I had to do as an addict, as an ex-criminal, as, you know, someone that was struggling in life is to ask others for help. So, um, you know, working in the field and being down there in the streets, you know, like it's real easy for you to go from the guy that's handing them the bottle of water, right? And, you know, maybe a, a fresh pair of, you know, underwear, you know, and a toothbrush and toothpaste, you could go from that guy to just being the example and, you know, coaxing and guiding someone that's interested in getting help or seeing that you are the example into getting help, you know, so having people that have some type of experience in the field on the front lines is very important. It's the gateway, you know, they talk about gateway drugs. Well, this is the gateway to recovery we're talking about. You know, so right. there's a, and then there's the other thing. And I just wanted to mention a real brief is you mentioned that, you know, like my experiences down there, uh, some were really good and some were horrific, you know, like to see people actually 
um, dead as a result of their decisions, you know? And it's like, well, are they harming someone? Yeah, they just harmed themselves. They inflicted emotional trauma on their families and their, their co-workers and, you know, their community. You know, this is taxing. But, you know, like the drugs keep changing. And that's the scary part because we went from, you know, heroin and crack cocaine to, you know, PCP. And then, you know, it's a little mix of everything going on out there when it comes to those things. But the predominant one is the fentanyl and the fentanyl being supercharged in the elephant grade fentanyl, you know, where it's like somebody can use this substance and, and go down quick just by handling it, you know? So there's that. And then they came out with this new drug. And this is probably what you guys are really referring to is the xylazine. Now, xylazine is a tranquilizer, but when it's mixed with the fentanyl or heroin or even methamphetamines or cocaine, it produces different results within the person that's utilizing it. The problem is, is that it shoots the withdrawal from the drug and it's time and it's demand to have more on a physical, mental level. It makes it increases that. But at the same time, it's causing their skin lesions on people. People have open wounds. They're laying in the street, you know, and th they just don't have the adequate care systems in place. And we can get into that. But, you know, just to give you like the gist of what it's like to be out there on the street, it's it's horrifying. It's horrifying. Uh, it's very difficult to deal with people that don't even understand uh, where they're wrong. You know, like people think, well, if I put the drug down, that's that's it. It's over. Right. No. Well, you have to do something. And my experience has been that those periods of sobriety and clean time that I was putting together in my lifetime on and off again, uh, the things that worked was were fantastic. And it was helping other people getting involved, plug, plugging in, asking for help, helping others. Right. Uh, being receptive to suggestions and advice, you know, from people that have experiences, trying to model your behavior behind uh, your newfound mentors and friends, your newfound support groups. And, you know, like I used to tell people when I did groups and seminars and the rehabs and stuff, when you walk into a room, if you don't feel comfortable there, then you're not recovering. You need to get the heck out of there and go find some place that you are going to recover. And you guys are mentioning a little bit, you know, there, there's different treatment methods involved, too. And we can get into that. But, you know, it's helping others. <laughs> do, you, do you think well, that the first level of, of connection to help um, people uh, see the path or even develop the motivation to recover is, uh, is street level, at, you know, being on the street level and meeting people where they're at? with? I, well... I would think I would think that it would be up to the individuals involved. Now, if it's somebody that's a family member that doesn't have personal using experience, it might be a little easier for them to go out there and assist, you know, in different ways. But someone that's new to the uh, recovery process, I, I don't know. It's always going to be up to them whether they want to get hands on you know, on the street level. Now, there's a lot of ways to get involved and be uh, supporting. Just the other day we had in Philadelphia, we had something called the recovery wall. Now, this thing wasn't going on. The last time we had one was just before the pandemic and they hadn't had one since. Right. So this isn't like an outreach where people go and they walk around and, you know, they carry banners for their organizations or whatever. And it gets a lot of publicity and, you know, social media generated from it. And it's a great thing. Right. It also gives people an opportunity to share different experiences to see what's working better and what 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 roads can be going down. But here's the thing. Since the pandemic, they haven't had too many people doing these sort of things. Right. And when they do occur, they're limited. Right. But they're not only just limited. And this is where it gets really scary. Not as many people go. Now, I, I during the height of the pandemic, I would go to, you know, different AA and NA and different 12 step organizations. And they would deny me entry at the door because I wasn't wearing a mask, you know, and there was limited seating because they only let so many people into the room, which is like counterproductive if you ask me. Right. But at the same time, right. You got the people that are um, 
today, the other day, when we went to the recovery walk, there was 20% of the normal turnout that would go on for an event like that, which makes me ask myself, where are these people? You know, and if they're not, if they're not out getting high and they're not recovering, there's only one other option, right? And I, I think about that, like, I really think that they're fudging a lot of numbers on a lot of levels for a lot of reasons. But, you know, when it comes to, you know, the different things that you can do in the very beginning stages, there's a lot of ways to get involved. Uh, there's cookouts, there's, you know, meetups, there's movie nights, you know, and there's, a, a, you know, even people like... When I when I get involved with the recovery process with somebody, the one thing that I want them to do is create a reward system. And, you know, it has to include things that are going to benefit them. You know, so we talk about those kind of things during that process, you know, where it's like, you know, this is how you're going to, you know, reward yourself by, you know, going to these cookouts or going to roller skating or canoeing or whatever these different adventures are. So. Yeah. Kind of seems like a reward in itself, right? But <laughs> it is. It's very rewarding. Yeah. So you brought up warriors earlier and it made me think of, you know, appreciate the, the compliments and everything, brother. Uh, yeah. Recently had a, you know, one great work warriors with a uh, Chris Jansen, Brandon Spencer, Kip Rick and the boys. Uh, we did a chat last uh, this week uh, titled, you know, the zombie mind state type of thing and, and yeah obviously you know like you've seen i mean there everything is all clickbaity these days you know it's like tabloid uh, central on youtube because people are making oodles of money and they it's a competition for that shit but all that aside you know you see people kind of like it's like doom baiting as well of you know like oh the you know zombie apocalypse look at you know california's in shambles you know look at you know what's it, kensington philadelphia and these you know places where there's like a high concentration of you know people using these you know drugs like you mentioned the zalazol or or whatever whatever the fuck people want to make the make up these days i mean meth is bad enough right i mean i'm gonna ask you later with the whole with that and breaking bad and if there was any kind of uptick in popularity of that shit but uh you know going back to what you were kind of T talking about earlier as far as you know you know if people haven't had that experience of you know you know using hardcore drugs or, or whatever and it's hard for people to relate and you know like to even think about even have the thoughts of helping these people and it's more just like kind of the f uh fight or flight type of reaction that people have so is there a kind of any kind of way where we can appeal to your average person to be like hey you know like these people are struggling. They might have taken, you know, like these kind of soul snatching drugs, whatever. But we have to keep the human element in mind in regards to like the redeemer. I guess people can, you know, find it within themselves through their will force and, you know, care the general principle. Right. It, they just need to be shown, you know, certain things shown away, if you will. That kind of even though that sounds cliche. So uh, can you relate? at all or you know give more insight to that to kind of you know help out folks because yeah sometimes i look at the druggies and I'm like ah shit man it's, i mean you look them in, i'm not thinking of that about them like the scum of society but you've heard that how many times over the decades that kind of stuff uh even on tv they talk about it like that or whatever the news but uh a lot of shaming rhetoric right that yeah. keeps no division yeah right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so i my personal opinion, you know, there's there's a lot of stigma involved is the word that they like to use when they're educating us when we go to these courses or certifications or whatever, right? They use the word stigma. And stigma is, you know, like something that's sticking with the person on a mental note, right? So like they're in a recovery process, you know, you get a month or two under your belt and you have... Uh, your weight back up, uh, you have your uh, maybe a job, some money in your pocket, you're speaking to your family a little bit more, you know, like, and, you know, things are starting to improve. Um, but the mindset, you know, we uh, like the way I describe it is we have these uh, four lane highways uh, that are, you know, for all the destructive practices. 
right? So like, you know, all the things that led us, you know, to feel, oh, woe is me and all this other stuff, you know, um, I think positive affirmations would be a good dirt road to go down. You know, we need to put toll booths up for the four lane highways right away, you know, like and you have to recognize that the, the pattern of the thought process and you have to stop it. You have to stop it as the individual. And if you're part of that person's support group, you should be in the know of what those things are as well so that you can say, hey, John, you know, remember you told me that, you know, if you start acting all irrational and, you know, like things start looking a little weird, you know, like on this end of things, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you should try, you know, to check, check where you're at, you know, have something in place like a catch system. You know, and I talk about that kind of stuff in the groups and seminars quite often. Um, the best way to do anything, and I'm sure you guys will totally agree with me on this, is to write it down, to journal about it. You know, the first, the very first thing I always did in all my groups and seminars with the new person that just walked into the room is put a copy book, a black and white copy book in their hand and a pencil, you know, and tell them that. They need to, to write down their thoughts. They need to write down their game plans. They need to write down what works and what doesn't work. And nobody's collecting that book. That's I make sure that they understand that that's their book and they can take that with them when they leave. And it's going to be for their benefit to organize themselves in a way that's going to be productive for them. You know, I get very short periods of time. The, the one facility I worked in, you know, I'd be lucky to have somebody in, in my presence for seven or eight days but I could have them up to four months, but the average was like, you know, 15, 20 days and they're back out the door. You know, we call that taking an oil change, you know, like they come in, they get a little weight on, they get, you know, a couple showers under them, some clean clothes from the donation pile. And they're back out the door only to go back down the same road of destruction. So in these short periods of time, I would try to cram as much as I could, but journaling and positive affirmations, you know, for self is the best way to break the, the, the bonds, uh, uh, the, the chains of that uh, stigma. They're chains. It's slavery. It's mental slavery that people put themselves in. And you guys know exactly what I'm talking about. And then you hit him with the natty law, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, well, I'm sure you want to. Yeah. A lot of those chains, you know, those mental chains and, and the uh, beliefs about oneself really has a deep root, you know, back to early traumas and, per, you know, patterns of generational suffering. Right. And, and so that brings me to the question of what do you think are the real root causes of, you know, addiction? Unhealed trauma miseducation, lack of care in the households, um, conscious parenting, the education system, the propaganda from Hollywood and the music industry, you know, I, all these things, all these things, they all play a role. But there's something that you probably haven't heard before. And I talk about it very briefly throughout my work. And that's uh, vaccination injury early on in childhood, um, the DRD4 uh, opioid receptors, okay, are actually damaged by vaccination injury. And what this does is it sits, it sits the person into, and it's not something that occurs with every single person, but it puts people into a position where in order to get the dopamine release or the, uh, the serotonin release within the brain, uh, they have to they have to actually uh t they have to be stimulated more whether it's through chemicals or whether it's through action now as that person develops with that injury you know they find out that you know like they have to use more of a substance to feel like they belong or to feel you know the normal dopamine release that occurs like everything's a dopamine exchange when we first got on this call and we were hyped up about, you know, having this chat together, and we were all, you know, smiles and, you know, like there's a dopamine release that's going on there. Right. And that's that exchange has to occur within each person. Right. For themselves, for everything that they do, small amounts and large amounts. Right. And it all has to do with the chemical imbalance that's that's created because of the vaccination injury. 
It's very, um, very, very interesting stuff. The opioid mu receptor and the opioid receptors are definitely damaged by vaccinations. It's it's been shown in mice and rats. I've put the uh, links up before, and I'll make sure that I get you the links so that you can include it in this broadcast because it's kind of important for people. Yeah. To and then the perpetual use of a substance to try to get that dopamine um, up uh, right. does or so switching does of substance the body, right? It, it makes it harder to create that organically, doesn't it? It does. Me. It does. So, like I said, you know, like we had the four lane highways, we have dirt trails, you know, and we have to tread down those dirt trails of the positive affirmations, the good support networks, the practicing of good life skills, you know, implementing natural law correctly, implementing the trivium process the entire time, you know, uh, trying to return to nature in a more holistic approach. You know, all these things will help, but it's repetition. It's like push ups. You know, you have to keep working out in order to maintain your physique. But if you never had the physique, you know, you have to you have to get the instruction how to go there. You know, and that's every situation is going to be different for each person. A lot of the people, it's unhealed trauma or misdiagnosed mental health issues, which then doctors are handing them pills and prescriptions that are altering the chemical balances of their brains. And they don't even have that actual or that actual thing isn't an actual thing. You know, so when it comes to the mental health diagnosis itself. Uh, we use here in the United States something called the, the DVM-5. Uh, they might be up to six now. I'm not even sure. DSM. But it's, DSM. It's DSM. Yeah, I'm sorry. DSM. And that's the, the diagnosis handbook that everybody goes by for the definitions of everything. And, you know, it gets really interesting because when you see, you see you've got it, the DSM-5. See, she knows what I'm talking about. If you want to comment on that, I would love to hear what you have to say with your experience with it. Well, go ahead and continue your point and I'll, I'll bounce off that. So, so it, there's a root to these things, right? So like these, some of these medical diagnoses that are mental health diagnoses that are created all have numbers associated with them. And they also all have medical billing codes associated with them. You know, so there's a root to all this stuff. Uh, there's an organization called snowmed.com, S N O. M E D snowmed right.com. But that organization set the, the industry standards for billing and definitions for the medical industry worldwide, not just on a local level for the United States. It's transferred over into uh, ICD 9 billing and all this other stuff here in the United States. But around the world, they all use the same snowmed. And the interesting thing about that word is if you go to that website and start looking around, you'll see that these are the major players in the medical field for under the Rockefeller, you know, medical calling cards that they throw on the table. This is the this is what we're going to do in order for you to get paid for the insurance companies, uh, according to the legislations that we wrote, you know, bills on and this, that and the third. You, you have to follow these guidelines and you have to bill accordingly. Well, this snowman, if you spell that word backwards, this is where it gets interesting. It's. D E M O N S demons. Damn. So you, you got to go to the root. You got to go to the roots, man. I like going to the roots. So with the individual go to the root, you know, like, well, what is it? it? You just don't feel like you belong in society. You don't feel like you have a place because purpose in life is very important, extremely important. Um, You know, and then ask them, you know, like, did you, uh, do you have unresolved trauma? Do you need to know how to feel good again in life? Do you need to know how to, you know, self-talk your, your, yourself positively? Like there's a lot of different avenues, but the journaling is huge because now the person has a record that they're putting down on paper for themselves of every aspect of their recovery process, you know? Yeah. And the journaling is, is recommended for, you know, anyone who's struggling with, um, you know, stress, grief, 
trauma. It's a, it's a very helpful way to start to get more brain integration is journaling um, from with pen and paper, you know, bringing in the, the left brain, the frontal lobes in with the emotional expression and um, integrating memory as well. So yeah, the journaling is very powerful. You don't need to spend a bunch of money on that. You know, government's not going to oh. make a lot of money, but you can go out and get yourself, you know, a handful. I have like tons of journals, right? Get them on right. sale, you know. <laughs> right. And I, um, yeah, what you're sharing, John, is 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 amazing. Um, I I wanted to just to bring up. There's a trend, especially here in California, for um, medication assisted therapy. So to help combat the opiate um, addiction, there are creating uh, medications that are opiate based that then they're kind of doling out to people um, to replace their street drug. And so they go to the, you know, clinic, you know, on a regular basis. Some of these programs offer more holistic treatment, but a lot of them don't. And I was very discouraged. Um, I went to a, a state, it was through, I think, Partnership Insurance, which is like a one of the um, companies that uh, was basically representing Medi-Cal paying for treatment. And um, the trainer was, was, was talking about addiction being um, a physiological process, right? Which clearly, you know, as you described, it is, is affecting the phys physiology, but it was, they were totally neglecting any aspect of the psychological healing or the spiritual healing. They basically said that um, this is just what people need to do for the rest of their lives is come in and get these medications and be dependent on the system. And my colleague, he, he asked like, oh, well, what about the spiritual aspects of recovery? And the, the guy was just glassy eyed was like totally disconnected from that as even a concept, sort of poo-pooed it and just went back to it being a physiological um, medical illness, right? So I saw that as an agenda, you know, of the state and just wanted you to comment on the, on some of that. I, I think it's interesting that you, you, you kind of crossed a couple topics there, but the one thing that's very interesting is that and when you go back to the original definitions of these words that they use in the medical terminology, like psychiatry and psychology and, you know, these things uh, makes you think of what the origins of the word psyche is, which is soul. And I find it very interesting as I'm walking around inside facilities over the past couple of years and dealing with different people on different levels, they won't bring spirituality into the conversation but they'll very easily throw around these terms, psychology and psychiatry. And I'll just sit there like, yeah, it's all soul healing, man. <laughs> it's all soul healing. Every single aspect, whether it's putting together a, a regular workout routine or, you know, you know, practicing, you know, meditation or being mindful or, you know, just putting yourself around good people and like trying to do better for yourself. Uh, these are all spiritual practices. You know, like we're, we're, we're the defunct society that decided to say, well, the only time you could talk about spirituality is if you're talking about things that don't exist. <laughs> like, what do you mean? <laughs> if you're a spiritual person, your whole experience is spiritual. You know, and, and that's part that's part of the process, you know, like trying to see through some of this uh, lies and deception that they've, you know, embarked upon, you know, and inflicted on us all. You know, and, you know, they, they throw those terms around, man. It's crazy. But the other aspect of what you were saying is uh, the, the first part, the first question that you asked, what was the first? There was something that I wanted to say about that. I forget what you said, though. I, my brain sometimes. I just got through Helen. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I'm already like disconnected from how I brought that up. But I was talking about, you know, the the medical system and their oh, oh yes oh, yeah. Yeah. i'm sorry my apologies yeah so assisted medications right that's what we were talking about so this is a very 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 big topic and i'm in support of a lot of holistic based approaches i've got a lot of good friends that work as therapists and directors of programs that are involved with suboxone distributions and uh methadone and all these different uh avenues uh, of getting away from drugs. Now, here, here, I'm going to tell you what I tell the clients when I'm standing in front of them doing groups and seminars. Again, get out your journal, 
Okay, and this is what we're going to do, guys. We're going to write down. Well, well he, he, there's two different types of people in that realm that you just discussed, the assistant medication. The first person is it's somebody that doesn't, they're not on anything or they've tried different things, whatever, but they're not on anything right now, right? So there's a different avenue for someone like that as opposed to someone that's already on something. So like if I'm talking to a guy that's been taking Suboxone for six months, you know, or he's been involved with methadone for, you know, the three or four or six or seven years that they allow people to do these type of things, right? I would say something along the lines of, let's write down the plan to get off of it, the safe plan to get off of it, you know, because the, the body itself, it's a natural it's a natural organism that does not need these outside interferences. There are exceptions to that rule. So don't, you know, take that to the bank as a, as a, as a, a where for all for all. No. Uh, and then the, the other situation would be the conversation that they have to have with their care provider, you know, in both of these situations. So if they go into something and they feel like they might be comfortable utilizing some of these substances or they're already on them, the next conversation is, uh, I want it, I want to come off of these things. I want to get away from this. What is the timeline involved? How do I, how do I back away from these, these, uh, different types of, uh, medication assisted therapies, right? But also the MAT, right? Also the other aspect of it is, is that if you have people that are on it, right? There's there's a profit margin involved. There's a requirement for how long they're supposed to be on some of this stuff. Methadone, it's usually at a minimum of 18 months in the United States. Uh, something like Suboxone can be anywhere from a very short-term taper to get off of the drug. All and When I say short-term taper, I mean like, you know, the next four days, they're taking Suboxone, but now they're done. There's different studies that show how that's a very good way and method to go, right? But if you've got somebody that has, you know, unresolved trauma and they're physically dependent and, you know, they have mental health issues on top of the substance abuse, right? Or they have physical pain, you know, there's different avenues. So you, you want to make sure that you address the individual concerns of the person in front of you, right? But I would definitely recommend that if they're on something to work to get off of it and to have that conversation. And then to, in their journal to write down, you know, like uh, because I'm taking a lower dose or because I started this new medication, this is how I'm feeling today. This is my appetite today. This is my sleep, sleep schedule today. This is my mood and what others said about my mood, right? This is how I'm getting along and being productive or unproductive in society. Right. These are all important things. And then when you go to your your primary care doctor, which is could be a week or could be a month later, you want to have that conversation, like review those notes and have that conversation that, you know, I had seven, seven days of sleepless nights, you know, throughout the month. Uh, people said uh, I'm irritable or here, here. It's even better. Uh, I'm doing really well. It's working great. You know, like you want to be able to say that to yourself either which way when you walk into that primary care, you know, and this is, this is very unfortunate. So the other aspect with the MAT, and I really want to stress this is that there's a lot of different holistic approaches as well. And a lot of people don't bring them to the table because who's making a profit margin on that. You know, that's something that you and I, as a community, we need to do that. We need to initiate those things for our fellow human beings. And that's some of the projects that I've done in the past with the housing and and now with Art Gardens and some of the initiatives that I'm trying to plug in with Jim Gale with the prison reform, you know, program and, you know, these different aspects of things that the holistic approach is always going to be the best option. Always. You know, it's not it's not the only option, but it's always going to be the best option. And we I think we're all in agreement with that. Uh, the one aspect of it is, is that there's medical marijuana. Uh, some states it's legal, some states it's illegal. Like, I don't understand how that works in a society that's supposed to be civilized. Like, you can't tell me I can do something on this side of the street, but if I walk over there, I'm going to be beaten and thrown in torture cuffs and drug off to a jail cell and put in prison, you know, put in a prison system and have a criminal record that's going to affect my ability to be a father or be a community member or be an employee. 
You know, like these are ask or even a business owner, like these aspects of our society need to be addressed immediately. Yeah. But the other aspect is those other alternative mes- me- medicines that exist, like Kratom or microdosing mushrooms or microdosing. Um, there's another one. I, ketamine. Ketamine, microdosing. There, there's these different avenues uh, of different substances that are not popular uh, with the mainstream or the media or the medical industry because they don't have it regulated yet. I promise you that they're going to. And that's one of the reasons why medical marijuana isn't so prevalent uh, as an option, because they don't have all the regulations in place that they want to keep the profit margin where they want it as as a pharmaceutical company. You know, so and as a medical company, as an insurance company associated with these, as the politicians that are you know signing the bills for these companies. Kind of you know, so I, I know I went a little long winded with that. But when you talk about MAT, it's very personal to me. You know, I, I I was in a situation where I actually utilized medical marijuana and continue to do so. Right. Under the, the guise of the laws. Right. But I do it in a way so that it's beneficial and therapeutic to me. Now, my program isn't going to be good for everybody. Right. But what I will say is that I was also on meta, mental health medications and took this approach of getting off of the medical, the, the, the medications for my mental health, right? And then waiting some more time and then making a conscious decision in my right frame of mind at fully healed capacity that I felt like I could do at the time for myself a year after getting off of those medications, going to medical marijuana. Now that's, I don't know if that would work for everybody, but I would always suggest that, you know, you look at the timelines, a a substance like methamphetamine or cocaine could take 18 months to three years to actually totally remove itself from its imprints within the brain processes, right? The chemical inside of the body and what it did to us, right? Something like suboxone and methadone, those things haven't really been tested, right? Marijuana, I think it's like six to eight months, something like that. Alcohol could be as little as 30 days, all the way up to like maybe two years, you know, to repair the damage that was occurred, uh, incurred because of the use of, of those, those substances. So these are all factors that have to come into play. You have to make the decision as the individual. I'm going to go holistic. I'm going to have these conversations with my doctors if I continue to even see doctors. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to make sure that I'm making the best decisions for me the entire, you know, the entire process. And those are things that you would want to take into consideration for sure. So well said. Yeah, totally. And uh, as we all know here, you know, mentalism, the first cosmic law principle. And yeah, that's what people have to really get straight first and foremost for anything. And, you know, with whatever kind of, you know, prescribed drugs, either over the counter, under wherever, or street drugs, all these things can, you know, alter our states of consciousness. And uh, yeah, that's really interesting what she said. And It's almost kind of graphic thinking about the the time frame to really you know extract all that yeah the the impressions of those drugs in so many different ways on a metaphysical level physical mental emotional all these things right so wow that's really interesting and um yeah with the i find it interesting with the i mean i'm you know we speak we speak with a lot of folks in network in things of that nature you know going over shadow work and this and that and i hear a good amount of talk of like you know, all types of addiction, you know, it's due to, you know, unresolved trauma and this and that. And I'm thinking like, is it really all that black and white? Because, you know, I've been thinking about this as well and just going over my observations, experiences and, uh, you know, kind of what you mentioned as well, kind of alludes to the fact that, you know, like, for example, uh, growing up, you know, kind of in an area that was, you know, had a good amount of rich kids and these people were just spoiled. So they had oodles of money to spend on whatever the fuck unhinged or a good amount and so and especially with you know whatever kind of needle craft they might have had at the basis of that you know keeping that in mind you know that's kind of fresh information for me to kind of like 
you know, think about it in perspective, but, you know, just think about, you know, all these kids, you know, whether they had Ritalin or whatever the fuck, that creates an addictive mind state already. That's like a gateway fucking drug right there. So, right. yeah, and it's just, uh, it's, it's really sad that there's like these designer drugs and you see, you know, things getting glorified in the music. I'm glad you brought that up because you see all these people who are trying to act cool with oodles of money and, you know, sipping on lean or whatever the fuck, like, People can't even walk up, you know, stand up straight and people think that's fucking cool these days. I don't get it. You know, I've been out of touch from the States and all that. I know it's kind of like maybe from, you know, early, yes, you know, maybe like yesterday or whatever. I don't know what folks are on these days, but uh, yeah. Can you go into anything about, you know, what's kind of like the root cause of, of addiction so people can kind of really pinpoint that and kind of reverse engineer that to find that root cause within themselves that, you know, made them kind of go down that pathway of, you know, when we reap and what we, we reap what we sow. And so if we're sowing all these seeds of repet repetition of the same thing, you know, it's like we're creating our thoughts into actions and it, it's creating a character and whether that character is aligned and healthy, holistic or whatever, it's going to be either healthy, distorted or, or whatever. Right. So, yeah. And people in that distorted mind state, whatever, can't really see clearly in the mirror of what's going on and be honest with themselves. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, being honest with yourself is definitely like the number one thing that you that that's the beginning spark. That's that's going to light the fuse. That's going to change your life. And do so, you think that the journaling, that's so important because, you know, it's like that, you know, vulnerable safe space that people have where they can, you know, really, I'm sure Leslie get that all the time. Yeah, I mean, I've done, I've, I've got several different kinds of journals and I go back and forth in my life, whether I'm active with them or not, you know, for different reasons. Some of my journals had to do with dream work. Uh, some of them had to do with workouts and physical fitness, but uh, the main one was always the one about my internal uh, spiritual practice, you know, like, you know, and my spiritual belief, you know, like why I think I'm here and what I should do while I'm here and how I'm going to play that out. But you, you, you asked the question like the root. And I, I, I go back to that vaccination thing. I really think that if people, the, the thimerosal that I was given as a child uh, in my vaccinations, you know, my mother just did her to, you know, motherly duty took me to the state office or whatever, the doctor's office and got me my shots. That's just what everybody did. You know, nobody questioned, you know, and now with the plethora of information that's available to people nowadays, there's no excuse for you to go into any situation ill-informed or misinformed. Right. And you should always prepare yourself. Uh, the number one thing that most people in the facilities and out on the street, you know, I just got bored, man. I just got bored. Like they'll say it boredom, boredom. That's, that's the number one answer for relapse boredom. Well, that's, that's a self choice. You know, like you, you have to make the effort. You have to do the work. You know, nobody's going to do it for you. We used to joke around and say things like you can't get this thing through osmosis. You know, cause just because you're sitting in a room and sitting next to somebody doesn't mean that you're going to walk out of here recovered. Just because you listen to, you know, Mr. John go on for a half hour about, you know, the recovery practices that would work best. You know, like that doesn't mean you're going to walk out of here in recovery. <laughs> like you actually have to do the work, you know, and that's that's a huge, huge uh, road for someone to go down. Because uh, what they'll find in the very beginning stages, Derek and Leslie, is that they were wrong about a lot of stuff and they wronged a lot of people including themselves and you know they have to do work they have to do a moral inventory you know uh our one of our mentors mark passio talks about that all the time morality now the only other time in my lifetime other than you know when i found mark's work my good friend mark passio's work is <laughs> in the 12-step processes it's step number four you know, make a searching and fearless moral inventory. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was going to. I wanted to ask still, you. Like, yeah, please talk more on the 12 step program and your thoughts yeah, on so it. So, everybody yeah. always tiptoes around this moral inventory. And a lot of it is, it leads back to relapse for a lot of people or stepping outside of the process. 
that they were so, you know, enthralled with, you know, these people are doing it. I know I can do it too. And then you get there and they show you these 12 steps and they say, this is the program you got to go down. Is it the absolute program? No, it's not. And I know people that recover, they never stepped foot in a 12 step room. And some that recovered that walked in there and said, this isn't for me and walked out of there, you know, and still recovered because they had to drive to do it. Right. And they went down other alternative avenues of doing it, right? Through mentorship or recovery coaching or smart meetings, or there's all these different kinds of support groups for anything and everything under the sun. I know a girl, just as an example, her mother has cancer. She goes to a can. Well, she drank, she was drinking a lot over her mother's cancer. Is her problem alcohol or is her problem grief? And, And she doesn't channel it correctly. So she started to go to cancer support groups, surviving members of cancer support groups and, you know, all these different organizations, relatives, which, you know, they, there's so many different kinds. But what I'm the point that I'm trying to make is to put yourself around like minded people that have healed from that situation and move forward from it. Right. That would be like the, the, the main objective. But that, like I said, that takes work. So the other question that someone would ask me is, you know. Mr. John, Mr. John, what's the best 12 step room? What's the best, you know, what's the best recovery process? And my answer was always direct and it was always the same. The one you work, the one you work guys, it's always the one you work, right? You could be working towards total destruction. You're definitely working towards something in life, whether it's just, you know, existing or, you know, destroying yourself and others, or, you know, actually contributing to society in a meaningful way. And this is what the example of my work has been. You know, uh, my website, thelostprinciple.com is the principle of care. That's the lost principle, the one that nobody remembers and nobody cares about. You know, like, what do you care about? Like nobody, think they think, oh, I care about my family. I care. Well, no, when you wake up in the morning, you create your entire existence by what you're putting your time and energy energy into, what you're generating. You know, what your creation is, you know, and, you know, here's the us because look what we create. Look what we're trying to do as a, as a community, as a network, as individuals and people and family and friends, you know, like this is what we're trying to do. And it's, it's very difficult to put people into a position to, for them to admit that they were wrong. You know, so like the moral inventory you know, whether it's 12 step process or another process, it's very important for people to discover their own personal morality and to move forward with that. You know, um, where am I at on that scale? How do I treat others? You know, would I want myself to be treated that way? Would I like my mother to be treated that way? My father, my children, you know, like, and this is, this is where the, the rubber meets the road guys. A lot of people would they, would they get to that point where they have to actually do some self exploration and they're like, nah, I got to go. And they're gone, you know, and they go right back into those same destructive patterns. Bypassing. Um, yeah. So but, that, that would be the best answer that I could come up to with for that, for that. I got a follow up question with that then. Cause uh, you know, what you're talking about, you know, taking in all the moral inventory. I mean, I, I did this, you know, kind of, which led on to like a full blown type of a, uh, Cosmic apology grievance type of uh, alchemical awakening almost tool. And uh, it, it's extremely painful, especially if people have, you know, been doing wrong things and harming other people, harming themselves and coming to that, you know, epiphany of revelation or whatever. And like it, it's sickening and like just like any purging and detoxing, it's not, you know, pleasant. Right. So all these things are, you know, you know aspects of the healing process that people avoid whether consciously or subconsciously sometimes i feel because it, you know it's uh, kind of it's scary shit i guess you know <laughs> to put it plainly but i'm sure what have you seen experienced to with that on the level i guess and leslie also i'm sure you know had you know clients as well right patients so you know like this is this is where journaling could come in in hand, but also where your support group is going to be important. You know, like putting yourself around those same like-minded people, letting them know where you're at, 
you know, asking for help when you need it. You're going through a tough moment, you know, like don't be afraid to reach out to somebody that that's been through that tough moment before, because that's, you know, for every person that hangs up and says, no, that one person that says, yes, that's where the miracle happens. You know, like I've had a lot of people say no to me when I've asked for help over the years, but the few times where people did say yes, it was straight miracles after that. You know, like whether it was the guy that pulled up to me at the red light or, you know, on the bus next to me or, you know, at the local, you know, support group meeting, you know, I I, I would definitely, definitely use positive uh, reaffirmations, you know, like put yourself into a state of being where like, you know, like, look, I'm not that guy anymore. I'm working to change. You know, I'm, I'm out here doing this. I'm out here doing that. And that's when you got to take that inventory. You know, this, these are the things I am doing, you know? So, you know, the shame and guilt and the despair and all that stuff that goes away for those issues, for those issues, it does gradually leave the person, you know? Um, I think what's really important is establishing new memories and new uh, avenues. So like, like, I'll give you the example when I came out of the state parole, uh, when I came out of state prison and went to the state parole center in the city of Chester, uh, there, I was one block from where I used to cop drugs from, you know, and I had to walk out that door every day knowing that half the people around me were using, you know, and they're like, you know, giving fake urines and they're coming in late and they're sneaking drugs and alcohol into the facility and, you know, all those kind of things. And then one block over is right where I was always comfortable going and getting more, you know? So it's like being in that environment, I had to like forge new pathways around there and establish new memories. And it's not just physical locations, it's objects. You know, a lot of people struggle holding a can of soda in their hand because they used to smoke crack off of it. A lot of people struggle utilizing candles or matches, the smell of a match being burned, right? These kind of things are different types of trigger points. But you have to reestablish new pathways around all that. But the most important one, and I think this is where you were hitting a little bit, was the relationships that they destroyed or damaged. You know, after, you know, you could say you're sorry a hundred times, but the action of sorry looks better. You know, like my mother got to see before she passed away last year, she got to see the good son, the community worker, the helper, the honest, you know, genuine caring individual that she tried to help raise me to be right but then That's also cool. yeah but then also you know like my brother you know we didn't talk for almost eight years of our life up until the the past couple years before he passed away you know and he, the way he found me it was crazy he was watching a news report out of philadelphia while he lived in florida and saw me on the news talking about addiction you know, addiction, good, good things and bad things, very similar to what I'm doing right now with you guys, you know, and it went on the, the ABC six news or whatever. And he saw that and he could not believe that it was me that was standing there talking about the recovery community and avenues of recovery and work and in the field. He, he didn't even, it blew his mind. He couldn't get to the phone fast enough to call and say, I'm so proud of you today. I'm sorry that we haven't been together. You know, like there's still repair that has to go on in my own personal relationship with my daughter, right? And my my in-law family from that side of the field, right? Whether that occurs or not, I don't know. I put the ball out there the way I'm supposed to. I do the things I'm supposed to do. The one mentor and sponsor that I had in my life that was really beneficial to me, he said, you know, she might not be ready right now, but you know what? When she is ready, you better be ready. And he, ne he never lied. He ain't never lied. And I was luckily, I was in a position to be able to be there for her in different ways throughout her life as a young woman at 20 years old now, you know? So like these things are very, very important to, you know, there's some people that are just not going to forgive you. They're just not going to get over it, you know, and they're never going to think you're capable of change. They're never, you know, and then there's society itself. You're talking about karmic debt. You know, this person's out there using drugs, running around, stealing from the community. They hurt all these people. How do you pay that back? Well, it's, it's simple. You get involved on a community level and you help people on a community level. 
it's one of the reasons why I worked in the facilities I worked in and, and ran the recovery houses that I ran because I was a, I was what they called a booster, a shoplifter. I'd go into stores and I would steal lots of products and I would sell them for cash and trade that for, for the drugs that I was using. But how do I go into every single store and say, hey, look, I'm going to pay you back? No, that's not going to happen. That's not very realistic, right? But you got to do something. So, I, you know, I started the recovery housing and I did things of that, you know, that nature to give back to society on a level so that I could feel comfortable with who I am today. Yeah. You know, that's really, how I try to make things right. Really. But important. it's always about comfort. It's always about comfort. And that number one word, boredom, that's people lying to themselves. They're uncomfortable with their situation and they're not willing to do the work to change it. And they have to they have to change that. That's I was going to say, because isn't it about finding one's purpose and like just being actively alive and mindful, present in the moment? I, I don't know. Like boredom is like not even in my vocabulary, really, unless I'm describing something outside of myself. You know what I mean? So but it's sitting with yourself. Right? It's, <laughs> crucial. it's uncomfortable. You know, right, so it, it, is uncomfortable. Purpose. it helps yeah. out people so much when they discover that. And yeah, they probably find it a decent amount through journaling and stuff. And, you know, I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, Leslie, sorry. I really like what you're bringing up around the relationships and, and the complexities of that, because there there are a lot of bridges burned, you know, through addiction and um, a lot of lying and, and, and lack of honesty. And so there's there's a really required repair work there on, on multiple levels, as you're talking about. And I think that loved ones and family members, you know, um, really struggle a lot and get very confused about what to do. You know, how much to help, how much to offer, you know, are you enabling this person's addiction or are you supporting them through love, you know, to help them care about themselves to want to get better, you know, and I, I really um, want to hear your take on like how family members and, and loved ones can best help, you know, and maybe operate between this like not this care principle and then the self-defense principle as well and boundaries, you know, and how that helps or, you know, the process of recovery. So you always want to keep your, your, your personal goals and objectives with your recovery process in mind, right? I would say this, if you have an issue with someone that you can't resolve, right? And you're coming from these type of environments of drug use, criminal activity, mental health issues, you know, healing, you know, un, un, unhealed trauma, these type of things that you would put yourself into a position so that uh, you get a mediator involved. Okay. Some type of medium between you and that other person. Okay. And what I mean by that is it could be, you know, it could be a pastor, it could be a priest, you know, depending on what your practices are. Shadical hour grave. He does that. Yeah. Or it could be it could be somebody in your community through a, one of these volunteer organizations. They have specialized training for uh, family recovery. OK. Or family healing or family trauma. It could be uh, a relative or a mutual friend that you guys both have equal respect and uh, equal care for. Right. But also equal uh, ability to listen and, you know, like, and then I, well, I'll give you the example. And I, I try to use this in my groups and seminars as well. Right. Is that, you know, like when I came out of state prison, I had issues, you know, trying to have contact with my daughter and my, my in-laws that were raising her, you know, there was a lot of issues involved. So the things that I would do, and it was very simple for me was, and it was suggested to me, and I thought it was a great idea was I reached out to one of their cousins that I was very on good terms with and understood that they were open-minded and that they had a good relationship with me and were supportive in my process, yet at the same time would never harm or hurt that other person, me knowing that, right? And use that person as a middle man or middle woman or middle organization to, you know, as, as the, the linchpin that when things are heated and I don't like the results of what I'm hearing on the phone or the conversation that we're having, you know, in the moment, my emotions high, my feelings are high, my, my anxiety is through the roof. I'm depressed or grieving the situation to turn around and utilize this person as an in-between, because what it does is it separates the emotion 
that you have with that other person that you're disagreeing with or not thoroughly communicating with, you know, but that takes participation by both parties and the mediator themselves. But that's a great idea if you guys can ever initiate that in your in your process. And it's it's usually successful because, you know, by the time you browbeat or over talk the other person about the situation and you know like they'll they'll go to the other person and they'll turn it into logic and reason and not have to speak with the emotion involved right and then they'll get their side of things whether there's emotion and stuff going on on that and then bring it back to you with logic and reason and then you, there's still that communication it exists it exists it's not direct it's indirect but the communication itself exists and that's what's important. If you want any relationship to be successful, you got to have proper communication. And we lack in that as a society. A lot of our, our youth and, you know, they're socially distorted. A lot of them suffer from social anxiety and social disorder, you know, where they can't, you know, actually have coherent conversations in person or on telephones with people or, you know, through text messages. And, you know, words are worth a thousand, you know, meanings. You, you know, I t text you something, I could say yes, but what am I saying yes to? You know, so there's all these factors in play to utilize, you know, proper methods of communication. I think that's really important, but the mediator's huge, guys. Yeah, that's great. And how about when someone is still in addiction, in, um, in and out of sobriety or not yet committed, and there's a concerned family member, what kind of, um, I guess, advice would you have for the family and how to manage? It's very, very difficult in these situations because there's always that fine line between enabling the person to continue down their road of destruction and harm to themselves and others, and the other road of you know, like them getting better, you know, like that's what the, that's what the individual wants to see. So uh, th the other aspect of the mediator and the families involved is that there could be support networks that those people could go to and receive help. I know through the 12 step processes, they have uh, a non, a non is it's a N O N and it's all around the world. You have narcotics, uh, narcotics, anonymous, Anon, anonymous Al Anon, codependence, Al -Anon, Al -Anon, Al -Anon, like a variety of yeah, names. Yeah. They they have like a sub chapter of the actual addiction group. You know, they have something just for the families. And uh it, again, it's just you're as a family member, you yourself might not be using the substances, but you're definitely, definitely, definitely exhibiting behaviors and patterns that were supportive of that in one way or another. So you need to like remove yourself from those processes where I'm not going to give him the $50 when he asks for it. I'm not going to give him a ride to his dealer's house when he asks for it, you know, and it, it goes as far as, you know, like I'm not going to pay the bills for this individual because they're irresponsible, you know, like, and I think one of the best things that my family had did for me was to cut me off and to not help me in the system. And is that the answer for everybody? No, absolutely not. But uh, in my particular situation, it was very helpful because it was just another negative consequence that I did not want to suffer any longer in my life. You know, I wanted to have my family in my life. I wanted to have my mother as a mother and my brother as a brother and a daughter, my daughter as my daughter, you know, like all these aspects of it. So these are very important, but there are support groups out there and I would highly recommend that you know, you go in and you get honest and you tell people where you're at as the as the relative, as the father, the mother, the wife, the sister, the lover. It's very important. Yeah, totally. And on the subject, because yeah, it's cool you got you brought that up, um, Leslie, before, because I already had this in mind. Um as far as your observations, experiences, and all that, uh, you know, as far as like, you know, interventions, right? The family intervention where they kind of like kidnap the the the, dr the drug addict in, in a sense, right? And yeah, it's hard not to laugh because you know I got that you know graphic image of uh, Tyrone Biggins or whatever the Dave Chappelle character, the crack addict guy, whatever. But you know, like, is that not a good approach? Because you know, if we're talking about you know like property rights and all that, and like respecting natural law and all that stuff, um, I don't know. Does that even work for you know some people that are 
Got I think I think uh-huh. that there's a lot of play with some of that stuff, you know, that could be beneficial. However, again, it's the individual who's using the drugs to make the conscious decision to stop using the drugs, right? So if you were to set up an intervention type situation and you were to address the issues of how you are harmed and how others are harmed as a result of their other persons using or drinking or gambling or porn addiction, whatever it is, if you were to set that up in their life and explain to them, this is how you're harming us, you know, whether it's in person or on paper, that's a, that's a great avenue to go down. Um, when it comes to the point of like kidnapping somebody and taking them to like some type of retreat or something, I think that's a little extreme. And I, I don't think it's going to work overall in the long run. And it definitely violates natural law because you're, 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 you're preventing someone from, you know, doing something and not coercing, but literally forcing them to do something that they don't want to do. You know, unfortunately they're going to have to play it out. They're going to have to play it out, but, to present the option of support, you know, but in, in the, um, in the intervention to present the option of support and care afterwards, like these are avenues we're going to go down. If you're interested in continuing, uh, to use, if you're interested in continuing to get better, these are the avenues we're going to go down. Right. And to be like, you know, clearly concisely, explaining this to the person you know like well if you continue to use you're no longer going to be living here if you continue to use you're no longer going to be employed by me i'm no longer going to be your wife or your husband you know like i'm going to take a different route because i'm not happy and then people have that right so let them let them exercise that right and then if the other person the person that's putting everyone in that position to have the intervention you know they could be the weighing factors that make them say, well, I don't want to lose my wife. I'll just go to rehab for 28 days and come home and, you know, get my life together a little bit. You know, maybe I go back to use and maybe I don't, you know, but the, the point is, is that there's, there's action that occurs there every single time. Like I'll, I'll put this out there real quick too, because a lot of people disparage, you know, like relapses and, you know, in and out of rehabs, you hear stories, you know, horror stories, people in 10, 20, 30 times and coming out and still using, right? But here's what I will say. The person that's in that position of the in and out of the process, you know, they're still being exposed to truth. They're still being exposed to periods of clean time or medication assistance or, you know, avenues of recovery, people that have experiences with these things. Every single time that I went into a rehab, even if I came out and used the same day I was released, you can't erase what just happened. You can't erase the programming that was offered. You can't erase the the possibility of hope. It's still there. A lot of times it'll set people into a, a mind frame where they even go out and use more so, right? Now, that's not that doesn't sound like a good thing, but guess what? By them doing that, now they're suffering even more consequences and heavier ones, right? So that could be the deciding factor that makes that conscious being, you know, become self-aware that this is destructive. I don't want to pay these consequences anymore. I'm going to do something about it. Yeah, yeah, great. This concept of hope, you know, um, I've seen it in operation, you know, working with people who were pretty hopeless. And the turning point was the establishment of some kind of a hope for a better future. And I've heard some people kind of downplay the, this concept of hope, but I, I want your, your opinion about what hope, the importance of hope itself. Hope is very important. Uh, hope can come in many forms. It could be the experience of someone like me who, you know, is announcing to the world, I haven't put a needle or a crack pipe in my mouth in 10 years. That that could be the hope, right? But it could also be something as simple as, you know, like the person getting a job, you know, and like now they feel like they're productive, you know, or a person getting involved with some type of organization and volunteering, now they feel productive. That's hope, you know. But hope itself as a concept is, is crucial for the individual because they have to have some type of internal drive, you know, that allows them to believe 
that there is a better way for them. You know, I, I stress that to people, you know, that you find something that makes you feel purposeful in this world to do something, anything, because the people in this world need it. The animals in this world need it. And the ones that have been harming our society and species for so long now, they don't deserve to reap the rewards of what we can create as a, as, as a society. So they need to be put into uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> the ones that are running the world right now need to be put into uh, uh, an intervention, so to speak, on a societal level. And it's not just the ones that are running you know, the, the political spheres, it's the medical spheres, it's the assistance programs, it's all these different things that exist in our society need to be revamped, need to have more collective conscious action from others in, right? So there's all those things. I would definitely put that out there. Yeah, thank you. I love how you um, just painted this picture of the ruling elites, these uh, social engineers, these, you know, that are, they are in a sense in a very dark place of their own addiction and, sure. you know, feeding off of us in a sense to feed their addiction. And so we are ultimately all, you know, enabling, um, you know, this process and we're enablers. So if we can maybe start to see what's going on from that lens. And then, like you said, I love that idea of this like huge, uh, you know, massive intervention of like creating our own boundaries around how we're going to interact with this, you know, uh, sick system, this sick uh, controlling class. Right. Um, and that by doing so, you know, that in itself is bringing um, healing. Right. And so that's a great, it is. Yeah. it is. And some of the things that help me heal as an individual, and I'm sure you guys are very familiar with this as well as simple things like being involved with nature, putting my hand in the dirt and soil, you know, walking around barefoot, you know, uh, eating fruits and vegetables that are locally grown or grown in my own garden. You know, these kind of things are a healing process, having proper, uh, information and education when it comes to animal care, and dealing with them to the best of your ability, you know, like interacting with uh, other elements to our existence besides our television sets and our paychecks, right? Because that's where a lot of people are, you know, their cell phones, their television sets, their, their sporting arenas, you know, all these things. And, you know, like the thing with voluntarism is that, you know, like we could have these different things in society, but through proper education, People won't utilize them any longer, and they're going to implement things that are better. It's one of the reasons why I came up with Arc Gardens. See, Arc Gardens puts uh, people into a different uh, possibility. This is arcgardens.net is the my latest project. And I, I've been utilizing all these different avenues of technological ability and uh, reaching out to all the different networks that I, I've been involved with in the past couple of years in my processes. And I'm going to put myself into a position where I'm trying to put animals, recovering people from all different walks and food growing all into the same barrel. And, you know, natural law, <laughs> natural law using nature and it's going to be on the back of a turtle is the joke that I keep telling. Like, cause we've tried all these other delivery systems and you know, we put together these great presentations, these great videos, we're doing conferences and all this, you know, and it's like, we're not reaching anyone outside of our algorithmic boxes. Right. So like art gardens is a concept of healing on a community level, a concept of healthy living lifestyles on a community level. My game plan is to document a lot of the, the, the things that exp, exp, uh, that occur with this process, right? But also to go down the avenue of, you know, like how Jim Gale has his situation set up where this is not in your jurisdiction anymore. I've got the real title to my land and you can't have access to it unless I allow you to have access to it. Creating it all under a foreign trust and when they come to the door and they say, well, you don't have licenses and codes up the money, you know, whatever certification, blah, 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 whatever they say, 
The answer is, no, thank you. We don't need your services here. This is not in your jurisdiction. And to put people into a position so that all of us that are involved with it are under what's called a private member association. This is what they do. We're talking about the ones that rule the world now, right? They put themselves into a position so that non-disclosure agreements and private member associations are the only way they contractual with each other to do business, okay? And all their money's in a trust. And nobody has access to it except them for their whatever their purposes are, right? See, I don't watch what they say, right? I watch what they do. That's very important, right? So how do they get like the Trumps and the Bidens and the Obamas and all the Clintons? How do all these people do this stuff? Well, you, you hear about it all the time, but they don't focus on it. Do you hear the word Clinton trust foundations and Biden's this and that? You hear about these things and they're not allowed to talk about it or interact on a governmental level with any of it because they sign non-disclosure agreements, right? So we as a community should also do the same thing. So that there is no outside interference unless we invite it in. And the, the smart move is to not invite it in. I'm also going to be documenting that with our gardens. And it has to be a community healing on a, you know, on a community level where it's not just me and the people that understand natural law. It's people that want to eat healthy. It's people that want to live free. You know, they, they live by certain rules and they don't understand that these actions and decisions are enabling the murder of children in the Gaza Strip or, you know, this continued uh, force that's going on with Ukraine or, you know, like people are dying every day. You know, we, we have people in our families, we have people in our communities that are suffering as a result of these systems that are in place. And we need to do more on our individual community levels to prevent that from happening. Growing our own food, taking care of our own animals, you know, being responsible to one another. That's a great start, man. And I, I'm definitely pursuing that till the day I die. That's how I'm going. That's my intervention. Yeah, <laughs> that's a beautiful example of, you know, turning, um, of, of transmuting, you know, the, your experience, right? Your suffering and your, your struggle into something that is, um, that is giving good into the world, you know, cultivating good. Yeah. I love all these points you're bringing up. You're hitting so much, so many nails on the head. I really want to just say this guys, cause it's important. Like I just lost my, my beautiful baby girl, Athena this summer. What a beautiful dog she was. Of course it cancels the obligation that I had to my brother. So now that my brother's been gone for a couple of years now, and that was his dog and she was family. So I was obligated to take care of her and she's given me glorious years and glorious moments and that I'll never forget. And I cried a lot of tears into that dog's fur over other family members and situations in my life, right. That have passed on since then. But th this past summer, like that experience, it broke me. It hurt me so bad because there was, pr there was things that could have been done differently to prevent it from happening. I don't want to get into all the details because it's going to be a thing in the future. I'm really going to get into this and make sure that it's covered properly. But this is what I'm going to say, guys. Now, I could have came out of that situation. I could have used drugs again. I could have went back to criminal lifestyles. I could have, you know, I could be laying underneath my blankets, you know, crying and grieving forever. No, not, not St. John. That's not how we act today. We're going to take that negative and that grieving process and we're going to turn it into something great. We're going to turn it into a positive experience for all those involved. It's going to become part of my story and it's going to help others in some kind of way. Here we are. Right. So I utilize technology to help me come up with a acronym for Athena. Right. It's advocating, teaching, healing environments uh, through nature and animals. <laughs> I got it all right. Okay. So, so it's the Athena project and it, it, there's a desperate need in one of the cities that, that, you know, that city I mentioned earlier, Chester, where, you know, there are dull populations running around. There's no animal control. And like we as a community are tired of it. We want to do something more. So the Athena project is going to get involved and, you know, we're going to launch this thing. So it's, it's a good way of like, how do you grieve properly? Proper remembrance, proper honor is always given, right? But you have to heal. You have to walk through those gates, man. 
as trying as it may be to, you know, think of her and think of the loss of her. And, you know, this could be a family member. This could be anything that brings you grief in your life or despair or fear or anger or any of those things, all those negative feelings that we feel. Channel that. Turn that sacred anger into something great. You know, make sure that you, you, you're heard, right? Art Gardens is a good chance for me to, to have these different projects, you know, floating around out there that are going to shine light on things in different ways that I could never even imagine. If you would have asked me eight years ago, nine years ago, John, uh, you're going to run, you, you know, tell me my future. You're going to run Recovery House. You're going to drive around the city of Philadelphia in a limousine. You're going to do help all these people. I would have laughed at you. That's impossible. Where am I going to get a limo from? Where am I going to get the money to open recovery? What are you talking about? It doesn't even make sense. If you would have said to me, John, you're, you're going to reunite with your brother, have a great relationship with him, and he's going to die. It's going to suck. But you're going to take his dog, and then you're going to take care of her. And then one day, she's going to die. And now you're going to launch something called the Athena Project to help dogs in the city of Chester. I would have been like, nah, I, I can't even comprehend what you're saying. But you have to go down the paths that are laid out for us, right? So if the two doors, you know, that are in front of you, the one's going to take you to your greatest moments. The other door is going to take you to your darkest moments, you know, your darkest depths. And if you get familiar with who you are and what you're doing here, you know, like you're always going to choose the better door. Always. And you're going to point others to their better doors, you know, and let people, you know, make mistakes. Let them relapse, you know, like don't, you know, like it happens. You know, a lot of people put a lot of uh, emphasis on clean time in these recovery organizations and communities. Right. But let me ask you something. If somebody next to you was dying from cancer and they went into remission, would you throw them out of your house? Would you would you lock them up and put them in a jail cell? You know, like these are things that we have to think of as a species, like how we treat one another and what our reactions to things are going to be. I try to be a lighthouse. I try to be the principle of care and action. I only can ask that others can see me as an example of what they can do for themselves in their communities. They don't have to do things the way I'm doing them. They don't even have to like me or subscribe to me or none of that stuff. But do something. Do something that's going to be great for you and those around you. Yeah, it's truly inspiring. Yeah, you're you're very inspiring, John. And that message. You guys are not who I'm talking yeah. to right now. I'm just saying, you know. I'm, I'm talking no, to you I know. All. Yeah, no, you're a gift. You guys are great, and you are both inspiring. And I really appreciate this opportunity, guys. Yeah, no, we covered a lot in a yeah. short amount of time. Yeah, you're you're awesome. Yeah, I I think you know I was thinking about this idea of boredom, you know, and that being. Um, a program to look outside of yourself to fill the need, right? To fill the gap. Yeah, the explore, listen, explore old mm -hmm. hobbies and interests. Take up new ones, you know? Go and join a sewing club or a painting class. Do things that are going to bring out your creative side. It's healing. It's very healing. I would yeah. recommend it to anyone that's struggling, anyone that feels bored. You yeah. know, bringing out the divine feminine within each other and, and within ourselves has been probably one of the best things that I've ever done in this existence. And I'm grateful to have the chance to do it. And it's an opportunity to, to have a relationship with yourself. That's different than it's been in the past, you know, and yeah. to recognize that creative seed within all of us and um, that, that the liveness comes from within. Right. And then, and then expresses in relationships to others. And you've done a great job of drawing those connections and, and the import how we are interconnected and we can create walls between us, or we can start to break down those walls. Bridges. We need yeah. bridges. Bridge those. <laughs> yeah. We need more bridges. We don't set them on fire. We, we, we build them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And connecting with nature, really seeing this as a holistic process and um, an integrative process, integrating within ourselves and integrating ourselves in communities, the mind, body, spirit aspect of the seeking the alignment between those, those mind, body, spirit aspects, um, the importance of hope building and the value, the intrinsic value of every person, 
right? And Absolutely. that self responsibility, that persistence and not giving up, right? You know, that the patience and persistence that is required um, for this, um, and to not enable, right? To have um, our our um, to know what to say no to, what to say yes to, right? There's there, this integrates so many of the concepts that you know we talk about in natural. Yeah, and the, the one thing that I would definitely say to a lot of people that are new to the process of recovery is get comfortable feeling your feelings. Get comfortable with reaching out to others for help. Get comfortable with helping others. Get comfortable. Make it become part of your experience. And when you do that, you'll have the experience of what it's like to be that kind of person. And you'll get addicted to that. That's that's the kind of dopamine release I want. You know, somebody, you know, I lost two <laughs> people this summer that were, you know, key players in my recovery house process. They were in my episodes, uh, the episode great, and then, you know, a couple of the other ones where, you know, the, the, the one guy, his name's George Nixon, he, he's having a funeral on, uh, I think it's a Saturday. And then the other one was Mo Diggity from South Philly. And uh, he's, he passed away in the beginning of the summer. And, you know, these, these people turned into people that were very impactful in their communities. Um, and I was grateful to see it and they attributed their success and their experience to doing that, to watching me do what I was doing at the time even though they didn't get on board with what I was doing at the time, which to me is a win. You know, it's a win. They might not have stopped using or whatever at that moment. You know, they, they may have moved on from my housing at the time or, you know, whatever, you know, but it's a win because they got to see that I don't, I'm not lying that this is my experience. You know, this is my experience, you know, get your own experience doing the great work in a different kind of way get your own experience with practicing the principle of care and helping others in different areas of things that you're passionate about you know these are huge guys huge and i, I really appreciate being on your show and um after watching your content both of you guys and i know leslie you got the girl talk thing and you got a couple other things going on and it's beautiful i want you guys to know stay tuned we're going to have some really, really special things coming up in the next couple of months. I got to spend the entire summer around uh, my good friend, Mark Passio, and I closed a lot of gaps with him, with, uh, you know, like our communications and, you know, like what we plan to do for the future uh, together in different ways. And uh, he's been very supportive and uh, informative when it comes to, you know, my whole art gardens projects and, uh, you know, the Athena project and other things. And I'm also in the works with uh, a very special, uh, young, I'll say young lady, very special young lady uh, who I'm not in a relationship with, which is like huge, right? Of creating a show that's uh, a co-host show. And we're going to, we're going to do something different guys. We're going to do something totally different. So stay tuned because th this is not over. Uh, I'm coming at you. I'm coming. I'm riding backs of turtles. I'm, I'm walking dogs. <laughs> I'm wagging tails. <laughs> I'm putting seeds in the ground and I'm still, still, still knee deep in the recovery process. <laughs> it's That's just great. what I'm recovering. Yeah. What we're recovering from today, guys, it might not be drugs and alcohol, but it's definitely a system that has failed us, has let us down, has harmed us and continues to do so. So let's all do something about that. Right. For sure. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's, yeah, it's like the parasitic, uh, aspects of, of all that stuff and yeah the whole detox process you know it, it's kind of painful yeah, or you have to uncomfortable detox from right. these systems all right you're a uh, derek you, it's one aspect of this that we didn't speak of and i'm glad you brought that up because detoxing from the system and it's it's harmful practices towards us as individuals and uh, our species collectively we have to get away from these things we have to not give them any power and that, that includes everything from not going into a voting booth to, you know, not utilizing their currencies anymore. And how does that how does that occur? You know, but I want you guys to stay tuned because I'm definitely going to be laying down a lot of groundwork for for my ultimate objective is the day I die is to actually be a free man.
to actually be free of karmic debt, you know, uh, anything I owe society, anything I owe individuals, I'm going to be free of all that when I go this time. Because I've already died twice. I got one, at least one more left. And we're gonna we're gonna play this out till till it's over. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. So um we're closing up here. So share where can people find uh, your work? Where do they keep up with your projects here? So uh, the the project that I'm working on right now, it's arcgardens.net. And that would be the one that, and that's the logo that's on the screen now for AG. That's the ink well. And notice the ink is green and the feather's green. It's like a leaf and a feather at the same time. It's kind of like the overall umbrella uh, and trust for the various projects that are going to be going on, hopefully on a worldwide level. I'd love to see people copy what we're doing and implement it on their own, you know, in their own communities, in their own ways, and then report back, you know, for the green print. The green print's going to be available there. As far as my work personally, you could always find my work on the One Great Work Network under John Penwell. I would suggest that you go there to find my work uh, and utilize that as a jumping board to jump around and see other content creators on the network if you've never been there. But the other thing is, is and I'm getting getting ready to revamp it, is the Lost Principle. Dot com and that's principal p l e the correct spelling of it and that's the principal of care so awesome A any final words that you'd like to share with our our listeners i think i covered it all i mean you guys in invited me to come on here and speak and I, I, and and to give my experience strength and hope when it comes to a topic that's near and dear to my heart man and it, i really appreciate y'all i really appreciate y'all thank you Really appreciate you. The good work. You guys are doing phenomenal, a, a phenomenal job with delivery and content presentations and the topics and, you know, the de occulting, the de facto Satanist elimination, you know, all these different avenues that are involved. And, uh, and I, I just can't wait to see what comes next, man. I'm really excited for all of us. Man, I'm grateful to hear that, man. It means a lot. I'm really honored to have you on today, John. Holy smokes, man. That was great. <laughs> That's really inspiring yeah, like just you know through your life experience we need to you know people need to bring forth their experiences that help other people because we can relate so much more instead of just posting info and you know i'm dropping a link of a video and okay like where do we go from there kind of thing and like yeah you're like doing so many fantastic things and you know got your hands on literally in the, so many communities I, I love it man and you know what you got going on with Corey and jim it, it's great and you know in between Philly and, you know, Pennsylvania and in Florida and all that. So East Coast, man, I, I love yeah. it. And uh, I'm glad you were able to brave the storm uh, and nothing was, you know, <laughs> out of whack or whatever with electricity out and all that uh, today. So, yeah, we're really grateful for. Yeah, if you guys want to see what's going on with the storms, you know, just go watch my content where I have the news broadcast with the uh, the revelator channel 3.3 the news and uh the new news now <laughs> yes <Yeah, sorry. laughs> i break down weather modification programs all that good stuff these are all hobbies and interests to me uh you know pointing out what's really going on because a lot of people are mis you know misled and and you know deceived you know they're living beyond uh, behind the illusion so yeah. We yeah. are the de-illusionists, the de-occultists. Yeah. And I appreciate having you guys on the network, mm -hmm. and I appreciate you inviting me on your show. Yeah. And, uh, I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Thanks, yeah. guys. Yeah. Real talk for real people. So Thanks appreciate for, yeah. it. Thank you, all our listeners. Um, thank you, John, so much for being here and taking the time out to do this. Yeah, I love the green thumb. Green thumb. <laughs> I get that green blueprints. Thumb. Natural law. <laughs> so, yeah. Much love, y'all. Take care. All right. Thanks. Take care. <laughs>
I give advice that I don't follow Cause it's twice as hard to swallow And you know precisely what the pill is made of